Welcome to the 12th episode of Bite Size JavaScript. In the upcoming episodes, we'll be talking about how we can test our JavaScript applications. However, before we can do that, we need a JavaScript application to test in the first place. So in this and in the next couple of episodes, we'll be creating a simple web application and our web application will be consuming the YouTube API. So we'll start simple and we'll continue to progressively evolve our application as we see fit. And in this episode, we'll start our journey by analyzing the YouTube API in the first place. In order to add YouTube functionality to your app, you can browse this page and learn about different API endpoints that YouTube provides to you. To get started, you'll need a YouTube account as well. And then you'll need to create a sample project on the developer's console by opening this link and then selecting create a project from this dropdown. Then you'll need to name your project and save it. Then we'll need to obtain our credentials and there are two types of authentication that you can use in this regard. If you have a server-side application that directly talks to YouTube, then you can request a YouTube API key and use that key on behalf of your credentials. And if you have a client-facing application, then one of the best ways to authenticate with YouTube is to use Auth 2.0 API that YouTube provides. In this tutorial, we'll be creating a server-side application, so we are going to pick the API key approach. And before that, we'll activate our API by clicking this button. Now our API is enabled and the message says that we need to go and create credentials to be able to use our API. So let's do that. We'll be using YouTube v3 data API for a web server. And for that, we need an API key. So we'll just tap this link to get our key. And we will give our key a name and copy the generated text and save it to a safe place. Now that we have that key, we can make our YouTube API call. It's really important to keep this key secure and private because anyone who gains access to this key can also make YouTube API requests on your behalf. And now that we have a key, let's play with some API methods using YouTube API Explorer by tapping this link. As you see, YouTube has many API endpoints and all of them are documented well. In our case, we'll be interested in this YouTube.search.list API. And when we select the relevant API method, we are introduced with a page that we can test our API. We'll be filling out some parameters on this form. For the part key, we'll be using snippet because the documentation says so. And for the channel ID, we'll copy this ID from the URL of Byte Size JavaScript videocast. And we'll be ordering the results by date. And that's all you need for a basic search. And as you see, there are many options to pick from. And the best way to learn about YouTube Data API is to spend some time playing with YouTube API Explorer, basically. And when we execute the API request we just created on this page, we'll get the following result. This output summarizes how we can make the request and what the outcome of that request would look like. Now let's try another one, youtube.video.list maybe, and I want to get the details of a specific video in this case. So I'll provide the video ID that I copied from this URL, and again I'll specify the part parameter as snippet. And when I run the request, I get a lot of useful information about this video, such as the title, description, thumbnails, and tags, and so on. So now let's create a new repository to test these API requests in Node.js. Our repository name will be bitesize.tv. And as you might have guessed already, this repository will represent the public website of Bitesize JavaScript videocast. So let's clone this repository, open it up in our IDE, and then create a bin folder and create a fetch.js inside our bin folder. Our fetch.js will be getting some information about Bitesize JavaScript YouTube videos by contacting YouTube Data API. And I'll also create a timestamp file and this file will contain the time of our last successful API fetch basically so that we'll only ingest the videos that have been created only after a certain timestamp. And let's quickly initialize the npm by doing an npm init. So let's go on coding. We'll first read the data in our timestamp path by using the read file method of the fs module as follows. And then we'll create a build script that takes everything in the bin folder and transpiles them into release slash bin folder. And when we run the script by doing an npm run build, we get our transpiled file back. So we are good, I guess. So let's also define a fetch script to call release slash bin slash fetch. And I'll also mark this script for execution so that we can run it as an npm script. So when we run npm run build and then do a npm run fetch, we are able to retrieve the contents of our timestamp file so we can move on to the next step. 
What we'll do in the next step is to get a list of videos from the YouTube API since that timestamp and then update our internal cache basically. So let's write those two functions and both of these functions will return promises and when our chain of execution completes, we'll be logging the result value to the console and if we have any error during the execution, we'll log the error to the console as well. Also, we'll be receiving the YouTube API key as an environment variable. This way, I don't have to save the key into a configuration file and any automation platform can pass that variable to my script, which is more secure than storing it inside the source code basically. While we are at the topic of security and best practices, one great document on how to architect modern web applications is the 12 Factor app. The 12 Factor app documents 12 different principles or factors as they call it that every application developer should know about. So if you are creating a containerized application or if you are architecting microservices so to speak, then passing configuration in the environment is the current industry standard way of doing things. This approach makes the management, isolation and distribution of your application configurations easier and more predictable. Now back to our API example, I'll just be lazy and instead of passing a configuration variable, I'll just hard code the channel ID and API URL as constants. That's fine because those constants won't be changing for a long time for our application anyway. Then I'll compose an API URL by joining those constants in a template string and I'll make a GET request to that API endpoint. I'll also need to remove the trailing and ending spaces from the timestamp, otherwise my API URL will be invalid and I'll get an error from the YouTube API endpoint. And when using promises, you don't return but you resolve, so we'll be doing it accordingly. And when you think about it, resolving is not much different from returning. You are just not returning the value right now, but returning it at a later point in time outside this current execution stack frame. So let's first run build and then do an npm run fetch. I get a key invalid error because I need to provide the key as an environment variable. So let's do that and now I get some useful information about a bunch of videos. And that's a good point to stop. To summarize, in this episode we have learned how to create a YouTube API project and obtain credentials from it. And using those credentials we called different YouTube API endpoints. And then we tried a server to server communication between the YouTube API and our server which is relatively simpler because all you need is a secret key to authenticate with YouTube basically. So what's next? Next up we'll go on building our application, we'll refactor it to be more modular and we'll be consuming additional YouTube API endpoints to populate our data. And until then, may the source be with you.